this is the speaker's press conference, and he will now take questions from members of the media. We will take them in tranches of four. Please, brevity is the name of the game. So you get up, you tell us your name, your media house, and then your question. In order for us to get as many questions in as possible, one man, one match it. And please, the preambles. Let's just use them. The director of media relations will assist in this particular endeavor. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my name is Ibrahim Al Hassan. I report for, for GH1 TV and Star Show. Okay, so one man, one question. Mr. Speaker, I just want the clarity. Have you re instructed the clerk to resubmit? the Human Sexual Rights and Ghanaian Family Values Bill to the presidency, or you relating to the old instruction you gave, which was rejected during the transmission? My name is Kwame Minka, TVXYZ Power FM. My question is simple. So tomorrow, as parliament sits, uh, Tell us exactly how the sitting arrangement would be. Because what, what we've been hearing is that uh, the minority then uh, has its, its majority. And would they remain as such, or there will be a shift? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Kweku Asante from Joy News and Joy FM. Mr. Speaker, during the proceedings in court, the Attorney General had cause to say that you had committed a crime by illegally procuring the services of Mesa Sori in litigating those matters in the Supreme Court. Specifically, he puts out a letter that has been signed by the PPA CEO rejecting a sole source procurement that you wanted to do as regards to Mesa Sori. Please, can you respond to the specifics and allegations that you had committed a crime in that regard? My name is Havila Kekele, Class FM. Right Honorable Speaker, there have been several occasions where uh, members of parliament sometimes drew uh, disagreement with some of your rulings or pronouncements on the floor, use certain words at you. Uh, how do you feel about some of these things? Um, Mr. Speaker, we will respectfully take a fifth one. We'll take a fifth one because of the brevity of the question so that we can get as many questions. Thank, in thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sergio Amensa, and I report for GBC Online. Just to reiterate the point earlier made by my colleague. Uh, speaker, as we speak today, the media, we are somehow confused. You address MP as a minority leader and a, uh, or a majority leader. You are told that, please, that's not my title. Or they'll just cut the line. Please, can you settle this debate for us? Who is the majority leader today in parliament? <laughs> the right honorable speaker. These are very interesting questions. The first one is easy. It's a fresh instructions to the clerk to parliament to resubmit the bill to the president. I'll leave it at that. The second one, please, it's not part of the duties of a speaker to decide where an MP should sit in parliament. It's not my duty. That determination in Ghana's situation, in various parliaments, these things we are talking about, majority side, minority side, don't exist any longer. That's why in my ruling, I use the term old school. The British model, government opposition, benches, and a carpet in between them. And so 
when you are shifting your political leaning, you have to cross that carpet to the other side. And that is why you have the term carpet crossing. Our parliament is not arranged in the form of government and opposition. And Ghana don't like the term opposition. So we decided to adopt the terms from the United States of America, majority and minority. So you can even sit anywhere. <laughs> but the numbers determine who is majority and who is minority. But in our parliament, the practice is for those who constitute majority to sit at the right side of the speaker and those who constitute minority to sit at the left side of the speaker. That is because after independence in 1957, we adopted the Westminster system, which is practiced in the United Kingdom. But we changed that, even to the extent that the arrangement of the floor of the house is in the horse shoe. So it's not always the case that the people to the left side are all members of minority. That's not the case now. And there's good reason behind this. As in the textbooks, the determination, therefore, in our situation, as to who constitutes majority or minority, is a question of numbers. As to where they sit, is the determination first of the political parties who influence who should lead the caucus or party wing in parliament. They, after various consultations, decide that these five people should occupy these positions in leadership. And so they are given the chairs in front. Then in consultation with them, the five leaders, they determine who should sit behind them. Because as a leader, you need somebody that you have trust, confidence in, who has the capacity, so that when you are in, in some difficulty, or you have a challenge, you can just lean over and listen to his or her whisper. So you have a say as to who sits behind you. The speaker is not involved in this one. The whips, particularly the chief whips, lead in trying to identify who should sit behind. And it also has to do with years of experience in the house and also the issue of gender and other professional backgrounds until you get to those who are at the back. Even though we don't sit on benches, we still use the term back benches. The speaker is not involved in this. After they have agreed on it, they then get in touch with the parliamentary service through the clerk who will get his uh, uh, officer at the table, together with the marshal, and they will get the names, print them, and place them on the various tables as decided by the various caucuses. The speaker don't come in this. Please, how can you call speaker to come and decide where people should sit? <laughs> it's not part of my duties. Number three. I will plead with you, go and look at that letter. He's the Attorney General. He did his service in Parliament here. I was leader then, when he was doing his service here. Yes. So I know him very well before he became Attorney General. Read that letter carefully. And 
that's one of the things they are missing. There's vast difference between parliament as an institution and the office of the speaker. The speaker is the party before the Supreme Court, not parliament. So as speaker, when the attorney general is taking a different position from my position, I should still contract him as my counsel. <laughs> I will leave it at that. Once I'll meet the attorney general, and I'll tell him my peace of mind. <laughs> On some legal issues and pronouncements he made at the Supreme Court. You know, attorney generals must be respected as learned. But it should not be part of what Obama referred to. Not me. It will not work. Number four. Half of the terms they use against me is part of the hazards of the work. We're doing everything as leaders, not to bring up our youth, to believe that indecent, intemperate, insulting and offensive language is the way to go. But people interpret freedom of speech to mean that freedom of speech without responsibility. You can just use any words. But you know how offensive it is to you yourself or your parents when it's used against your father or mother. But for me, what I believe in is that you reap what you sow. That one, nobody can run away from it. I think the last question, I answered it. As to who is majority, who is minority, I may declare to all of you, it's not a function or duty of the speaker. Thank you very much, Right Honourable Speaker. We will take the next tranche. I see Ahmed, um, the Director of Media Relations, is working to do that. Uh, Again, thank you your very name? Much. My name is Ahmed Usman Halid, Imam Zakaria, Gurguruwe. No, no, I have to pick the Constitution. Please, uh, I'll bet mine. <laughs> yes, can you open uh, Article 1 or 2? I just want to quote what the Chief Justice read in Supreme Court in the absence. My name is Ahmed Oshman Halid, Imam Zakaria Gurue. Oh, a freelance journalist, not from MPP headquarters, please. My school fees was paid by the speaker, so. Council, <laughs> article two. Yeah. I just want to read what the Chief Justice read in the absence of the speaker. I didn't want to paraphrase, I just want to read. Article 2, she says this way, one, a person who alleges, I'll leave all and come to surplus four, failure to obey or carry out the term of an order or direction made or given under the clause two of the article in this constitution commits a high crime under, under, under this constitution and shall, in the case of the president or the vice president, constitute a ground for removal from office under this constitution. Right Honorable Speaker, this was read before an open court Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was saying that 
it has instructed you to adhere to it others. Failure is that she's going to apply Article 2, Clause 4 on you. That even the President or the Vice President, if they go contrary, or if they, they, they I mean, refuse to, I mean, follow the order, they suffer this particular punishment. That's another speaker. Have you gone contrary to the Supreme Court orders? ruling or judgment. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my name is Evans of Tulabi uh, from TV SYZ and Power FM. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we want to know whether the four seats which were declared uh, vacant still remain vacant. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My name is Simon again. I report for the Accra Times. Uh, in one of the interviews, uh, former Majority Leader, one of which Mensa had with Joy News, he said, after your predecessor, former Speaker Michael Kay, give the ruling in 2020, he disagreed with former Speaker Michael Kay, and you supported his stance. I want to find out why did you go back to support your former predecessor when you expressed disagreement with his earlier ruling? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My name is George AC and I'm with Ghana Web. Um, by your ruling on the 17th, the four MPs were supposed to have vacated their seat and the court has ordered them to come back. What, what is your instruction to um, the clerk and those who are responsible are they going to be allowed to come in, into the parliament, into parliament or not? Thank you very much, Rada Honorable Speaker. My name is Nana Kweku Bufa, and I work with Opimso Radio in Menshia, Kumase. Speaker, you have been accused of uh, interpreting 1992 constitution when you declare the four seat vacant um speak i want to know did you do so thank you <laughs> thank you very much um, um uh, director i think we've taken the faith the faith one and so uh, mr speaker may um answer the um five questions with the uh, quick own on whether he misinterpreted the provisions in the 1992 constitutions when he declared the four seats vacant. Mr. Speaker. Well, you're talking about the same matter using different words. But that is before the Supreme Court. And I've given instructions to my lawyers to handle that. So that is not a matter for me to comment on. My lawyers are handling that. So all questions we were dealing with those issues before the court will allow the court to handle that. What I would draw your attention to is that the practice and procedure of parliament is unknown to many, including the court. And anything I do on the floor, I refer to the standing orders. The courts can declare the standing orders as unconstitutional or unlawful or whatever. Until that is done, as the presiding officer, I'm bound on issues of procedure, proceedings, and practice, apply those rules. And that is what we did. That is why in my statement, I drew your attention to the fact that 
What I did on the floor was just sharing of information, communicating to the members that this issue that was raised, and by the standing orders, I have options. Could have set up a committee to go and go through it and submit a report. That report could even lead to legislation. Or I could go and inquire into it myself, and then come and inform the House of my findings. That is in the standing orders. That is what I said is being construed to mean ruling. In our parliamentary practice, you don't make ruling when statements are made. Statements are commented upon. By the nature of the subject matter was debatable. And because of its importance, I had to give room for many more members to comment. But in trying to comment, they debated it. So that was what happened. But I'm clear as to my rule. Just inquire into it, come and share with the house in the form of information what your findings revealed. And that was all what I did. I did not make any order. Go and read the proceedings. I did not make any order. As for my friend, the veritable Honorable Oseche Mensa Bonsu, I'm sure he showed you the evidence where we had that discussion. <laughs> he disagreed, and I supported him. And now I have made a U-turn. I thought you should have asked him when my predecessor made the ruling, whether his side disagreed with him and allowed the same member, who is now second deputy speaker, to continue to sit or his seat was vacated. Did they agree with him or disagree with him? You should have asked him. So that one, he would need to produce evidence to show that this is what happened. I don't know where we sat and held the discussion, or it's on the floor, and the official reports are there for you to go and read, whether I got up and in my constitution disagreed with my predecessor. That is for you to, to make your findings on. And what's the last question? I answered all. Yes. And that's it. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. We'll take two more tranches and then we'll be done. Um, we're doing well so far. The Director of Media Relations is still going around with the microphones. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Um, you said the President and the Judiciary have said against the... My name is Oyeni Ampons. I work with Adam FM and Adam TV. Now, you said the President and the Judiciary have said against the Constitution. Could you tell us more on that? What would you say that will be the things or the acts they have done that will constitute, in your opinion, sin against the Constitution? Good afternoon, Right Honorable Speaker. My name is Nia Yukioka. I work for CTFM and Channel One TV. Now, Article 112, Clause 3 of the Constitution, as well as the Standing Orders 53, have been invoked by the NPP caucus for the third time this year, uh, whenever you adjourn the House indefinitely. Now, we want to find out, is this an abuse of that provision and what has been its impact on other legislative processes? Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Akoli of PCFM. Speaker, a number of people have described this if parliament as very chaotic based on events that happen, uh, which happened when this parliament came into being and what is happening currently. Mr. Speaker, how do you see this parliament? Are you proud of the if parliament? Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. My name is Kwabna Efre Martin. Um, I report for Original TV and Original FM. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know what influenced your decision of adjourning Parliament Synodai the last time we had our sittings, and what will be your decision if the same situation which happened the last sittings continue tomorrow? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My name is Clement Akolo. I report for uh, Parliament News 360. I also double as the communication officer for Parliamentary Network Africa. Um, Mr. Speaker, you uh, mentioned that the, uh, both the president and the, um, the judiciary have sinned. And um, when you look at Article 122 of the Constitution, it talks about um, contempt of parliament. So if they have sinned, uh, do they fall far of uh, the contempt of parliament? And what are you going to do about it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. I think that's the fifth question for this tranche. I get the feeling that this could be the last one. Am I right, colleagues? Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, with your kind permission, if you may answer the five questions that we prefer to you. The, the two, two of you raised a question about the sinning of the president and the judiciary. Please go through the constitution or the laws of Ghana. There is nowhere where the president can refuse to receive a bill passed by parliament. In fact, the crafters of the constitution are so careful that they even took away veto power from the president. So in Ghana, our president cannot veto a bill passed by parliament. It's clear in the Constitution that the president will receive the bill passed by parliament. If he has concerns, he will communicate to parliament that I have concerns on this bill that you have passed within seven days. Then he has 14 days to put across those concerns back to parliament. And parliament is called upon to reconsider the bill, taking his inputs into consideration. That is what is in the Constitution and the laws of Ghana. So if the president refuses to even receive the bill, what has he done to the Constitution? You understand? Two, in the Constitution, the president is permitted to refer the bill to the Council of State for advice. He didn't even do that. So the term I've been used is very mild. <laughs> in the case of the judiciary, a bill is a bill. It's not law. It's just a bill. Uh, this is a draft that is being discussed. The judiciary is going to do what? Be part of the law-making process. Tell us what to do in the bill. It's only when is passed and assented to by the president, then it becomes law that the judiciary can come in to interpret and enforce. There's nothing like that. 
And this is something that immediately, with supersonic speed, it should have been jettisoned, not entertained at all by the court. Now, what it means is that anytime any bill is before us, and we are working on it at this stage, anybody can just take it to the court. And that will mean that parliament will have to stop and wait until the final determination of what? What are they to determine? Please. We are doing this for Ghana and not for only today's generation. For generations yet unborn. We are building a durable, sustainable governance structure that gives certainty to everybody that is the rule of law that prevails, not of man, or the rule by law. The two are not the same. When you rule by law, people are not certain of the law. And so even investors ran away. And as a leader for so many years, from 2001, I've been a leader. I can mention so many serious investors who say they will not invest in Ghana because of uncertainty of the law. Attempts to invest here, you will definitely have branches of the law and then the courts and the system cannot tell you what the law is. And they lose a lot. So when you talk about unemployment, underdevelopment, and the rest, now who calls them? Leadership, I believe strongly, is cause. Everything else is effect. Even though followers matter. Followers matter. And that is where, in fact, we applauded the efforts of the president. When in his inaugural speech, he talked about us being citizens and not what? Spectators. Today, Ghanaians are now more spectators than citizens. I think you have to wake up and become the citizens that he called us to be. That is where I'm moving towards. I don't have any ill will or malice, no. I don't have any ambition. If there's honorable Bagwin or whatever people don't want, please, that one, I can assure you, I'll go and relax. And my holy village is always there to welcome me. I don't have any problem at all. But once I sit here, I take the decisions and I'm responsible. Nobody else but me. That's why I started with my oath. I swore the oath. And at the end of the day, when I'm to account for my life to my creator, Nobody is do that to do that with me. I'll be alone. <laughs> and I'll be there. Those of you who will come later. <laughs> because I believe in life after death. In fact, we have you told that place better than here. So I have no problem with dying. I'm always prepared any time to die. And, but you will come after that. And <laughs> you come and meet me there. <laughs> <laughs> eh? <laughs> I will tell you what seniority means. <laughs> <laughs> the right honorable speaker shall live to tell of the good works I'm of the Lord. Hey, there's, there's one on there. Uh, oh, okay. The, 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 I have the indications that there are some two critical questions. So yeah, maybe I'll after finish, that, yes, then we that. can quickly go away. Oh, recall. I recall, I can't say it's an abuse. Oh. The Constitution permits them to do what they do. It's just that, please, 
Don't only think about today. Also think about tomorrow when you are doing some of these things. And for me, as I sit here, I thought the focus of those in government shall be about government business, not even the position they occupy. Which is more important? It's government business. After the position you occupy, if you work well, you may even get a higher position. Yes, <laughs> eh? It's the good people of Ghana who will decide. So I'm surprised that some people are focused on that one. But tomorrow, you will hear from me. <laughs> we will take, we are bringing proceedings to a close, but I see Our that parliament since, so oh. far is transformatory. In fact, this is a parliament, I've been from the first to the eighth. The first was foundational. And the late Right Honorable Justice Daniel Annan had to use all his experience and wisdom to establish the parliament. And so he started by transforming the rules that we inherited from the 79 to 81 parliament, that's the third republic, and also putting the structures and personnel in place, creating the opportunity for further training, education, and the rest. He did that. The second parliament, led by Right Honorable, the late Right Honorable Peter Lajete, Focus on trying to strengthen uh, the second speaker, I should say. Second speaker, third parliament. To strengthen the institution of parliament. And you recall sometimes he had some rough edges with the president. No wonder he lasted for four years only. <laughs> and it established a four year term for speaker of parliament. The fourth was trying to stabilize the fourth, uh, the third speaker. And that was Right Honorable Ebenezer, Ebenezer Sechi Hughes. I worked with all of them. The fifth came, and that was our beautiful lady, Supreme Court Judge, Justice. Adeline Bamford Ado. And she, with her experience from the bench, focused on the rules and dignity of the house. So you could see her dressing, her posture, her patience, and everything mattered to the institution. Then, the next speaker. That was my brother, very good friend of mine, who was my chief whip, became my deputy leader when I was the leader. Later on became first deputy speaker and became speaker. So he used his experience in the house and his connection with members particularly their dealings at the Parliamentary Service Board to initiate a lot of things. And then our professor came. Who in 1990 to take us on issues in the of Ghana, the political science department. So we studied together. I knew him long before he came. And I happened to be the second duty speaker to him. So I have all that record and all the happenings in the house. And I saw how we struggled to change the rules of the game. But before I became speaker, the voters changed the rules. And so you now don't have a majority where you can just sit down and just put the question. And you are sure the eyes have it. 
And so most attacks, there is no day that I will go and preside without calling the leaders to my lobby for us to go through the agenda of the day, which is usually captured on what? The order paper, yellow. This is what is on the paper, cut from the business statement. How do we handle it? Then the leaders will tell me, those that they agree, those that they disagree, even when they disagree, how do we handle it? We discuss all that. Okay, how many from each side of the house? We discuss that. How many minutes per person? We discuss that. Then I just come to preside and enforce what we have discussed. That is why it's difficult for us to be sitting at 10. Because sometimes I have to get them to make sure that there's some peace before we go out there. This is what we do on a daily basis. I just don't come and preside and impose my ideas. Even when it goes to voting, we agree. We will oppose. If you give eyes during the voice vote, we will challenge your decision. We will count hairs. We will do secret voting. We will not allow public voting. We discuss all this. And so even so, the discussion at that period, when people, leaders go on air and go and reveal those conclave confidential information, what is that meant to, be, to achieve? I should not invite them to discuss things with them again. What will happen on the floor? In spite of all that, for four good years, four good years, people are still not appreciative. And I am the target. Hey, this is my God. Hey. <laughs> He's a living God, though. <laughs> so please. Mr. Speaker, we, we are live on uh, GH1, GBC. Oh, you are live. And uh, we. we, we... <laughs> I would, I would crave your indulgence that um, we take, uh, I've seen some crucial questions that I think must be asked so that we can round up, so that they don't search out just for spending too much of their live air time. And so we'll take the final tranche of questions and then uh, we, will, we will bring proceedings to a close. Very quickly, name, media house, question. No preamble. And Thank you very much. My name is Ernest Kofiedu. I work with the Delhi Guide newspaper. Right, Honorable Speaker, at the last agenda date, you said that because of the issue of composition and that of the fact that Parliament had the current number to do business, but they have the current number to undertake decision. You are recalling the House tomorrow. Can you tell us whether these issues? have been addressed, and whether there has been meeting between yourself and the leadership of the House, such that tomorrow's recall will also not degenerate into that confusion. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, good afternoon. My name is Brian Sassari from Penn TV. Um, in your speech, you just said that um, you expressed concern about the fact that members of the House now um, are resorting to the Supreme Court to deal with conflicts that happen in the House. And you believe that that wouldn't help. Now we're having a conflict now. And I want to know that um, how do we handle this conflict resolution process and who is to initiate it? Because you said you have been doing this for many years. So how can we come together and solve this impasse. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Let's go on. Um, my name is Isaac Kando, a freelance journalist. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In your speech, you indicated that the matter before the Supreme Court could have been handled internally through dialogue and compromises. Uh, please, is it too late?
we are rounding up. Is that um, ha have we satisfied you now from this corner? Okay, I think um, we can. No, Jara, no, Jara. I think we can uh, successfully bring proceedings to a close with Mr. Speaker answering these questions. But I must also indicate that, Mr. Speaker, that TV3, 3FM, Joy FM, they are all broadcasting live. In fact, I have received City FM, GH1, TV, and I think, is it TV? They are all live. So, um, we, today's been one of the days that we've had the most live coverage, and we're grateful to you before the deputy comes to say thank you. Just to let you know that we are live on all these channels and on our own channels as well. I'm extremely, extremely grateful to the media for this coverage. That is what is expected of the media. And truly, for these 32 years, without the media, we wouldn't have gone this far. So, congratulations. We always disagree. But once we have agreed to disagree as part of our life, it's permitted. There's no problem with that. Please, ask what will happen tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Because I don't control that. But you know, what happened? The day of the adjournment, I don't see the young man again. Oh, you are the one standing up there. Yes, yes, yes. You know, as I told my friends, on the MPP side, I had three options after you walked out. left with the NDC members. Accra proceeded with the business. Would they have been approved by, by, by the NDC MPs for government? Even if they did, would they not go and raise an issue about quorum to take decision? So that was not a legally accepted option. I have decided to adjourn till the next day. But knowing the nature of the disagreement, would it have been solved within one night? No. Because I've seen that the nature of the disagreement goes beyond the house to the powers outside the house. And so we needed to engage many more people to be able to resolve the disagreement. So you need more time. And since I have estimated the time, I decided that it should be what? Indefinite. After we resolved that, then parliament could be recalled. If people were mindful that there's some agency for us to resolve it, they would have come together faster for us to talk, negotiate things, resolve it, and come back. But I tell you, apart from some senior citizens, patriots of the country, who actually got in touch with me, the leadership of the MPP members have not gotten in touch with me. They haven't. My good friend, Osei Chairman Sabonsu, spoke to me. Because he wasn't even around when this thing happened. And we discussed this thing. I drew more light on it. And he said, oh, he didn't know uh, before granting interviews. He said those things. But now he can also say, I should bring my <laughs> official report. You know? <laughs> so, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of the resolution of the disagreement. And so I don't know what will happen tomorrow. But I'll be available to preside. You understand? And so that is the situation now. Uh, the last question. Proposal. Uh, 
proposal. Well, am I now to propose it to you and Ghanaians? Or I should have been making the proposals to the parties so that they can be negotiating and compromising. I think that's the best way to do. And I'm expecting that, like the, in fact, I need to praise some leaders because the first to get in touch with me, I think was Apostle Nyamiche and the, the boss of the Christ Apostolic Church. They were the first to come to express concern. I had a lengthy discussion, you know. Then later, uh, the, a delegation of the Council of State also came to meet me in the office. And when I explained all the situation to them, in fact, many of them were really surprised because what they heard on air and what I told them and said they could cross check from the proceedings or other days. They were really surprised because they didn't know that was what took place. There was so much misinformation and all those, and I don't want to go into those details because they are before the court. At the end of the day, the judgment of the court will set a lot of precedents. But don't forget, the law is that the Supreme Court can always differ from its earlier decision. That is a danger. So for a purpose, I can give a judgment and ruling to favor the situation. Tomorrow, I say, ah, no, 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 no. No, I disagree with that. And that is permitted by law. So when you tell me that it means that the Supreme Court is supreme, and so when it orders, I must obey. Ah. <laughs> when I know the same Supreme Court can disorder, you have to raise a question back. I'm a lawyer by profession. And I, the first time I appeared in the Supreme Court was 1983. 1983. That was my first case in the Supreme Court. I don't know whether those who are going there now were born, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. The last one is uh, when I was young, I think when we were in the senior high, we were not calling it senior high, we were calling it secondary school. There was some song, it's too late, too late to say that you are sorry. <laughs> After you broke in my poor heart. <laughs> when I needed you, needed you to satisfy my soul. <laughs> you turn your back and say. <laughs> now, I think we should add singer to Mr. Speaker's <laughs> Because... Uh, the skills keep adding as, as we go along. I, I said he was an old woman in an old man's skin. He, he refused, but... Mm. And so um, I think that uh, you don't agree with me that we've had a very fruitful good afternoon.